I'm a strong believer in open access journals, and I was one of the signatures of the Varmus Brown Letter to Science, which called for a boycott of journals which wouldn't go open access. But that letter eventually led to Harold Varmus and Michael Eisen and Pat Brown starting the uh, PLOS journals, uh, which I think have been very successful. And I was convinced of the need for open access journals um, by a number of arguments. The first is that there has been a long, and actually quite remarkable situation in the uh, biological database world. When the, when the nucleotide, the DNA sequence databases were first established uh, in Heidelberg at the European Molecular Biology Lab in 1982 and uh, by the NIH in the States uh, very soon after, uh, both of these databases which archive the world's public uh, DNA sequence data, uh, both of them were established on the grounds that these data were open and public to everyone. So I could go today to um, the Embel Nucleotide Sequence Data Library or to GenBank uh, and, and if I had the computer capacity I could download it in its entirety, I could wrap it up in pink ribbon and I could sell it legally. The access is, is totally unconstrained and I, I think without that uh, a tradition uh, then or without, without, without that principle of open access uh, then scientists would have been unwilling uh, to deposit nucle nucleic acid sequence data, DNA sequence data, uh, in these databases. And without the archiving and deposition of uh, DNA sequence data, then much of the analysis of genomes, for example the hum human genome, much of that analysis would simply be impossible because we wouldn't have access to, this, to the data. So. That was a very good principle established over 20 years ago and, and in, retrospect, in retrospect was not self-evident because the tradition in uh, other fields, for example in, uh, uh, in chemistry, uh, has been uh, that there are large archi archival databases but they're commercial. Uh, they are either owned uh, by commercial companies um, or they are owned for example, by the American Chemical Society, which although a not-for-loss corporation uh, charges uh, its users an arm and a leg for access to these data, although these data, of course, come from the public domain by and large. So, it, in retrospect, it wasn't self-evident uh, that the DNA sequence databases would, would be open access, but, but they are, and that established a, a very important principle. And it also established a principle or a tradition in the bioinformatics, bioinformatics world uh, that software is by and large open access. So nearly all of the major programs we use uh, uh, for the analysis of sequence data are, are freely and publicly available. And again, that's not true in chemistry, uh, where most of the software uh, which chemists use uh, is commercial, and you buy it from commercial companies. It's true that in bioinformatics you can go to a company and buy a package of programs, but uh, I've never had to do so in, in my career, and most bioinformaticists can find all the software that they need uh, uh, as open source, open source software. And that has, ha, has had great advantages out of the field. Now in publishing, in, in scientific papers, what's surprising is, is how long it took the community to wake up to the fact that we were freely giving um, uh, our papers to journals. Uh, we were freely donating our time and energy to, to journals as editors, members of editorial boards, or, or as referees. Uh, and then we were buying back this corpus of knowledge, either personally or through our libraries, university libraries, uh, at great cost. And it took quite a long time before the community as a whole you know, woke up to this extraordinary no anomaly. And I think what clearly triggered, uh, the, or one of the triggers of the open access movement in, in, in journal publishing, was the fact that certain publishers were uh, increasing the cost of their journals to, to libraries in particular, 
way above uh, the rate of inflation. And we started getting uh, or seeing that our university libraries were having to cut journals simply because they could not afford the price of the subs subscriptions uh, because there's no way that the budgets of uh, departmental or university libraries is going to, going to increase at the same rate. And therefore, our access at that time, primarily print copies of the journals, was, was, was being restricted and was getting more difficult. Uh, I think that, that was one impetus for, for the open access publishing movement. But there, I think there were, there, there were others. Uh, second was the realization um, that the growth of the biomedical literature, at least, is so large um, that uh, we are going to have to use computational techniques to access that literature. And that, of course, is made possible by the fact that most, most of the scientific literature, modern literature, is now available electro electronically. Um, and you know, there's a, a very active field in computer science and natu nat natural language uh, processing uh, in which one can use computer programs to, uh, to analyze um, the, the, the text of the scientific literature. And that is one, one way in which one can uh, attempt uh, actually to, to try and find out you know, what has been published. Now that's not possible unless that literature is freely available. At the moment, most uh, natural language processing techniques are using abstracts. Uh, because abstracts are free, freely available because of the pressure imposed on the publishers by the National Library of Medicine uh, of the NIH uh, through their Medline project. And uh, nearly all publishers now uh, uh, make freely available abstracts of papers uh, to Medline and usually do so in advance of publication. And that is wonderful. Uh, but, but of course, there's, there's, there's an enormous difference between abstracts and full text. This sort of analysis of, of literature really only works, in fact, in a very similar way to, 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 to DNA sequence data, if all the data is available in one place, in, in, in one archive. Uh, so with sequence data, we have GenBank and the EMBL data library, which are essentially, essentially the same. They swap data every, every night. And the NIH have started uh, an archive called PubMed Central for the biomedical literature, biomedical literature uh, and the Wellcome Trust have very recently announced uh, a similar project uh, in the UK uh, and there will clearly be very close collaboration between uh, the new, new UK project and, and, and PubMed Central at the NCBI. Now, this will allow access to complete text of all the open access literature. Um, but at the moment, uh, and of course it, that is but a fraction, for me these are two of the most important reasons for open access. I mean, the first being uh, just you know, the commercial reality um, and the feeling that we've, we've been ripped off by the commercial publishers for far too long. Uh, and the second, the kind of ut utilitarian argument uh, that if all the scientific, scientific literature were open access, then uh, computational techniques for its analysis would be enormously enabled. The third, of course, is the fact that you know, if you go to a third world country, you know, if you go to the Department of Zoology uh, in the University of Nairobi, yeah, in Kenya, and look at their library, look at their journals, and it's absolutely appalling uh, what they have access to in, in, in paper access. And uh, the fact that nearly all, all major journals not nearly all major journals are now published electronically, at least gives them, princ in principle, uh, gives them a mode, of, a mode of access through the internet. Now, the World Health Organization and others have been uh, fairly active, uh, and particularly in the medical literature, and some of the commercial publishers have indeed signed on uh, with uh, programs which make uh, their journals freely available uh, to third world countries, and that's great. But uh, it's not clear that how long those will be sustained. Um, they could be switched off tomorrow. I mean, because they have the whims of the commercial publishers, and of course they're not complete. They don't. don't they'll, there will still be journals which a researcher in Nairobi will not have electronic access to without payment. And um, and at the University of Cambridge. Uh, can't afford to buy electronic access to uh, all the journals it needs. I'm damn sure the University of Nairobi can't.